brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. One of the Dubia Cardinals has a rather inventive and radical proposal to help ensure that the next Supreme Pontiff is chosen wisely from among the College of Cardinals. His proposal comes with a severe rebuke and criticism of Francis's recent consistory, where measures had been taken by Francis to limit the ability of the cardinals that were present to speak their mind. No hard questions were permitted. Reportedly, no questions at all were permitted, because almost no questions were going to be allowed at all from the beginning. This was not a dialogue session. The cardinals were limited to their language groups for discussion about the reform document of the Roman Curia, and then they met behind closed doors with little idea about what was said between them and Francis. That has never really been made public. And the cardinal in question, Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, is one of the dubia cardinals. And he called this consistory a useless gesture, since consistories are supposed to help cardinals from different parts of the world get to know one another. In the next conclave that does choose the next supreme pontiff, it's expected that the cardinals who will participate, which is all of them, will mostly not know each other. And while Cardinal Brandmuller doesn't actually go out and say it, that situation will leave some open to manipulation. I have a letter for you here from him, which he calls for a radical reform that the modernists would have in order to ensure that the next conclave chooses a pope wisely. And you know what? The modernists would oppose this thing dramatically, probably, although they might be the biggest endorsers for it, as I'll discuss after you hear it. The letter is short and gets the point. The letter comes at the same time that a radical proposal is coming from the modernists with official but quiet sanction from one of the most important conferences of Catholic bishops through their media outlet that is published officially by that country's conference of Catholic bishops. What is that proposal? and Why is it so radical? The proposal is nothing short of a written constitution for the Catholic Church. You may think that's a good idea, but arguments against adopting sec secular governing norms for the church aside, imagine this crop of bishops and cardinals writing a governing document that everyone in the church, the Pope included, would be bound to obey. Imagine them having the interpretive power over that document and how that interpretation is then inflicted on the church. Imagine if they then, if when Francis signed it, he declared it infallible. After the Cardinal's letter, I will cover that absolutely terrible idea in brief. But first, let's get to the letter of Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, who was one of the signers of the famous Dubia. The convocation of a consistory after such a long time prompts a reflection on the nature and task of the Cardinalate, especially in the current circumstances. It must also be emphasized that the Cardinals are not only members of the conclave for the elevation of the Supreme Pontiff, the true duties of the cardinals, regardless of their age, are formulated in Canons 349 and following the Code of Canon Law. It reads, quote, The cardinals assist the Roman pontiff either collegially when they are convoked to deal with questions of major importance or individually when they help the Roman pontiff through the various offices they perform, especially in the daily care of the universal church. And they especially assist the supreme pastor of the church to the collegial action in consistories, see Canon 353. In ancient times, this function of the cardinals found symbolic and ceremonial expression in the rite of aperito oris, of opening the mouth. In fact, it meant the duty of frankly expressing one's own conviction, one's advice, especially in consistory. That frankness, Pope Francis speaks of padicia, which was particularly dear to the Apostle Paul. For now, unfortunately, that frankness is being replaced by a strange silence. That other ceremony of the closing of the mouth which followed the apparito oris did not refer to the truths of faith and morals, but to official secrets. Today, however, there is a need to emphasize the right and indeed the duty of cardinals to express themselves clearly and with frankness precisely when it comes to the truths of faith and morals, of the bonum commune, of the church. The experience of recent years has been entirely different. At the consistories, convened almost exclusively for the causes of saints, forms were distributed to request speaking time, followed by obviously spontaneous remarks on any sort of topic. And that was it. 
There has never been a debate, an exchange of arguments on a specific topic, obviously a completely useless procedure. A suggestion presented to the Cardinal Dean to communicate a topic for discussion in advance so that remarks could be prepared when unanswered. In short, for at least eight years, the consistories have ended without any form of dialogue. The primacy of the successor of Peter, however, in no way excludes a fraternal dialogue with the cardinals, who are obliged to cooperate assiduously with the Roman pontiff. See Canon 356. The more serious and urgent the problems of pastoral governance, the more necessary is the involvement of the College of Cardinals. When Celestine V in 1294 became aware of the particular circumstances of his elevation to the papacy and wanted to renounce the papacy, he did so after intense conversations and with the consent of those who elevated him. A completely different conception of the relationship between Pope and Cardinals was that of Benedict XVI, who, a unique case in history, made his resignation from the papacy for personal reasons without the knowledge of the College of Cardinals that had chosen him. Until Paul VI, who increased the numbers of those who participate in conclaves to 120, there were only 70 cardinals who participated. This near doubling of the College of Participating Cardinals was motivated by the intention of accommodating the hierarchy of countries far from Rome and honoring those churches with the Roman purple. The inevitable consequence was that cardinals were created who had no experience of the Roman curia and therefore of the problems of the pastoral governance of the universal church. All this has serious consequences when these cardinals of the peripheries are called to choose a new pope. Many, if not the majority, of those who will, who will choose the next pope do not know each other. Nonetheless, they are there to choose a pope, one from among them. It is clear that this situation facilitates the operations of groups or classes of cardinals to favor one of their candidates. In this situation, the danger of simony in its various forms cannot be excluded. In the end, it seems to me that serious reflection should be given to the idea of limiting the right to participate in a conclave, for example, to cardinals residing in Rome while the others, still cardinals, could share the status of cardinals over 80. In short, it seems desirable that the office and competence of the College of Cardinals be updated. Limiting who can participate in a conclave to choose the Pope is definitely a radical option. It would guarantee that the cardinals from the peripheries, as Francis likes to call them, couldn't be manipulated into choosing whoever the manipulator wanted as Pope but it would also leave the choosing of the next pontiff entirely in the hands of Francis's loyalists. Look, it's not only an infeasible solution that would provoke outrage from the faithful and from the various bishops' conferences from around the world, but especially from these countries that Francis calls the peripheries, which is an insulting name for them if you think about it at all. It also wouldn't solve the problem at hand. Another group, a radical group from the other side of the church, ideological spectrum, has a solution of a different kind to a different problem. What they believe the church needs in our time is nothing short of a fully written constitution, like the U.S. Constitution. Written constitutions are frankly overrated in the world of secular governments, since interpretation power beats the written word every single time, though at least having the document written does have at least the strength of making a counterargument against stupid decisions they make. But it's an idea being promoted with, with the quiet support of the French Conference of Catholic Bishops. Brace yourselves for this one. Headline from LaCroix, a constitution for the Catholic Church. The idea of creating a con new constitution for the church is not new. No, it's definitely not new. And it's been rejected before because it's not a good idea. The Catholic Church is not a secular institution and should rarely, if ever, take its cues from the secular world. It's the mystical body of Christ. You're going to hear them claim that this is an entirely human institution, but it's not. It is the mystical body of Christ. It's divine. But here's the main argument they need. They make, anyway, for the need for a written constitution that will allegedly outline your rights as a Catholic and how the church is to be governed. This is like nonsense on stilts here. Quote, the synodal, synodal consultations hold the promise of meaningful reforms. In that context, the Vingards of Institute for Catholic Research has constructed a proposed constitution for the Catholic Church. If accepted and implemented, it would thoroughly overhaul the way in which the church operates. Most modern states in our day and age are governed by a constitution that underpins their secular laws. A constitution lays down the fundamental rights and obligations of citizens and functionaries. A Catholic constitution would do the same for canon law. 
here's the thing though you canon law there are canon lawyers who help you with this stuff there's no constitution needed but anyway sorry for interrupting it continuing the question is do the spiritual values enshrined in the gospel not already form a kind of quote-unquote constitution for the community of believers which jesus quote-unquote founded wow the answer is no the church is a completely human structure according to the article just as jesus imbued though he was by the divine presence of his father imbued is a different interesting word remained totally human to survive jesus needed to eat and drink he got tired and needed to sleep he would take shelter in the midday sun he spoke aramaic but needed an interpreter when responding to a greek list speaking hellenist in the same way the structure of the church is entirely human it can suffer from faulty human management it will benefit from incorporating the best human insights in fact our present church have, suffers heavily from institutional maladies incurred over the centuries here's the predictable list of problems male domination and excessive uniformity inherited from roman law and class divided top-down bureaucracy copied from feudal kingdoms to mention but a few end quote are you surprised to see that in there are you surprised to see any either of those things in there one of the problems in the church today is that the hierarchy is dominated by men according to this view it would be a subtle thing because a uh, thing they're saying here but most catholics in our time believe that the governing of the church should be open up to everyone regardless of their flesh that is what most believe the data from Kara and other groups consistently shows that. And because most believe that the modernists can make such astoundingly radical claims openly with the backing of sympathetic bishops. Look, I'm not gonna quote that article again, but it does get worse from there because it lays out what the proposed constitution of the church would be. You won't be surprised when I tell you that this constitution will enshrine liberty, equality, and fraternity into the church the values of the French Revolution and the values Francis enumerated in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which came out, I think, in 2020. That is what it would do. The article is explicit about it, too, saying that the proposed constitution would eliminate what they erroneously call recent developments in church doctrine, like limiting the sacrament of holy orders to men and the teachings of Inhumanae Vitae. Yes, they claim that is a recent development. This article was published in LaCroix, which is not a Catholic newspaper that's weirdly published by a soft drink company. It's published with direct oversight from the French Conference of Catholic Bishops. Yes, the French bishops are supporting this to some degree. The proposed constitution, though, goes even further, claiming that church governance is only legitimate if it is based on the consent of the governed. Think about that. They claim that the laity should have a say in all serious church decisions. That is a full secularization of the Catholic faith. That is emptying the deposit of the faith of its divine content and replacing it with the so-called wisdom of the world. The legitimacy of the church is rooted in the fact that Christ founded it upon the rock of Peter and that there is an unbroken chain connecting the popes of our time and the bishops to the apostles. That is where the church gets her legitimacy from. It cannot get it from any place else. And the French bishops are allowing drivel like this to be published. Be warned, folks. This nonsense is in keeping with the synod of synodality, with the, with the value of synodalism and synodality. And you will see movement in this direction from the synod of synods when it concludes in 2023. So what do you think of the two competing proposals? Are both Cardinal Brandmuller's and that French Constitution thing proposal both equally nonsensical? Would Brandmuller's proposal make things better or worse? I tend to think it would actually be a, something that could lead to schism. That's kind of my suspicion. But let me know in the comments, please. And like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As does sharing these messages on social media. That does help a lot as well. Thanks to the patrons of this channel for your continued support. It is greatly appreciated. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.